it's easy to, to sing songs, a song like, you know, when you're, you know, young and saying smash the state. It's like, yeah, I believe that kid. You yeah. know, do I believe the 50 year old man that's gonna say smash the state? <laughs> So I want to talk about a couple of things. I want to talk about the new record, which I really loved. I want to talk about the 30th anniversary of Dookie and the 20th anniversary of American Idiot, which are all kind of happening at the same time. So Mike, that means this interview is going to air in 2024. That's an anniversary of two really important records. That's a brand new record and a big stadium tour. How are you feeling about the year that's coming up? I mean, it's exciting. We got a huge tour coming up and I think we're, with Saviors, I think we're about to drop honestly, some of the best music we have ever written and recorded. So um, I'm just excited for people to hear the new record and for us to get on tour. I, it sounds like that's what I should say, but honestly, that's how I feel. It's exciting. It really is. It does feel like a bit of a statement, the record. Like it, it, the, there, there, there's something to it. Um, I, I can't quite put my fingers on it. Billy, how did you want to approach this record? Writing the record, I was coming from just all different angles. Like I, there would be there would be a time period where I wanted to write just like straight up like punk rock songs that was like look Bono brains. And then uh, there was other songs where I wanted to have like almost like a Brit pop thing that was going on with something like uh, Good Night Adeline and uh, um, Fancy Sauce and Saviors and stuff like that. And then, um, then I just kind of kept kind of going back and forth and then we had all of these songs and, and I was I remember just saying, like, let's just get in the studio and let's get let's get out of our the the normal places like that we record in Los Angeles and in Oakland and let's take a trip. Let's go to let's uh let's go to England. So we went to Rack Studios and we started recording there. Uh, we called Rob Cavallo and he jumped all over it, wanted to to rec uh, record with us again and produce and and so I didn't really know how it was coming together. I just knew all of these different, and then and then suddenly, like as we were recording, I think like because we were, we were in the room together, um, putting the arrangements together and vibing together and and getting our sound. You can all of a sudden you felt something that was like cohesive. That uh, and all of a sudden we were like, oh my god, we're making one of the best records we've ever made. It does feel like. Um there's a, way, there's a way to say this that I, that I don't want it to sound, but it feels like a bit of a reclamation. It feels like when I listened to this record, it, it felt like you guys saying, hey, we're, we're, like, we're still in the running for the biggest band in the world. Like We're still in the running for making a really great generational record at this point. Do you know what I mean? It's a weird thing for you to respond to. I know. I, I, yeah, I, know, well, I, know, I, I know. It was definitely, we were definitely trying to write one of the best records of our career. Uh, you know, that's for sure. Now, you can try all you want, doesn't mean you're gonna do it, but we put all the effort in there and we knew that, you know, that was the important thing was this record. You know, we even held off on a lot of touring this year and said, look, let's just really focus on giving these, so these songs time to evolve and become the record that it is, so. Also, we kind of, um, it's a weird way, like we featured ourselves in the record musically. Um, like my drums sound like me playing them, you know, yeah. his his guitar and, and Mike's bass and the way that we work off each other. And I think it's because we were in the room together recording this stuff, you yeah. know? And a funny thing, when we were at Rack Studios, uh, Muse was in the, one of the other rooms and I was like, hey, come, come check our shit out. And they came in and they're like, you guys play together? <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, yeah, they're like, oh, we haven't done that in years. Oh, <laughs> holy, they're like truly impressed. and. Uh, that's it's like, oh, that's cool. Like, and then how, we how saw similar? their studio and they had like all kinds of cool tricks. And I mean, it's rarer and rarer, man. Like every, I feel like every day I talk to more and more bands who like, they might not even record in the same city as each other right. anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like how similar with, for Trey, like how similar, given that you work with Rob in this record who worked on American mm -hmm. Idiot, worked on, on Dookie, how similar was the way you recorded this to the way you guys were recording 30 years ago? Um, Pretty similar, really. Right. We, yeah, we, you know, it's like you know, analog, mixing board and you know microphones in a room and using all the the stuff that we're good at which is you know i guess playing our in acoustic instruments and electric instruments and i know it just uh just seemed really natural and, and it, it came together in a really exciting way like we we're just fired up it was the, cool yeah i i think 
you know, when we recorded records like Dookie and American Idiot, we wanted to record something re that reflected the way we play live. And like what the, what you hear, like when we're playing in a club or an arena or wherever, that you're gonna get that when out of our albums. So, uh, and, um, and I, that's basically the same approach so it's been the same thing. Has it always been that like that? Did you ever not do that? Um, I mean, we've done a couple of projects where it, they were definitely like, uh, we purposely made music that wasn't supposed to be played live. <laughs> really? <laughs> but, but yeah, I think uh, it was, um, but yeah, this is just one, one, you know, we wanted to just make a great rock record, you know, with yeah. like, you know, something we're, you know, we're not playing to tracks, we're not playing to, it's just straight up live um, harmonies. And, um, you know, there's like this footage of me, of us playing, I think we're playing on spools in like 1992 and we're somewhere on a farm in, in Minnesota playing in front of a bunch of like punk kids yeah. and jumping around. And it's like, there's only one microphone so me and Mike were singing harmony together in one microphone, and it was like, I just I was looking, I was like, God, I, I had two thoughts. I was like, the first I was like, how cool and endearing it is like, and that that we're singing in the same mic, and then the other thought was, oh my God, I bet Mike would had to smell my breath like yeah. the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we shared a toothbrush back then. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of like. But a lot of bands, when they get to your level, kind of lose that. They kind of lose that energy of all of all playing together. It's great that you can still have it. You know what I mean? I mean, I think again, it's about being in the room with us. We have a certain thing um, when we get in a room together, and even if we're just playing quietly and structuring a song or working on it. I can hear what Trey's doing with his kick drum. I can hear what's going on with the snare, and I can hear Billy emoting a, a vocal. Or if we're just playing a, a riff not even right, thinking about structuring a song or anything, we're just playing a riff. There's a certain feel to it. That if you play it enough in a room together, you're gonna know what to do yeah. if you're doing it right, yeah. you know? And even paying attention to the lyrics too, like helps like me and Mike get a groove too, like knowing like kind of where Billy's at with the song, what, what he's trying to say, like let's be in that mood with him musically. I mean, if it, I mean it's, we're that, into it like we just we really just threw our, everything we had into it i mean the, lyrically that's really interesting because the, the i found this record really interesting lyrically billy i mean on, on strange days are here to stay there's a great line strange days are here to stay ever since bowie died it, it hasn't been the same i mean bowie died in 2016. there's a song called living in the 20s which talks about um school shootings and uh like a sex with robots and ai and it, it just every it's it these songs felt very reflective of the very kind of dystopian world that a lot of us feel like we live in. How did you approach this record lyrically? How do you see your responsibility as a songwriter at a, at a time like this? It takes a lot of time, to, for one thing. So it's like trying to take everything line by line instead of just like one big, uh, uh, especially when you're writing stuff that's topical or political. I, I, I wanted it to come from the heart just as much as like a love song. You know. what, do you, what do you mean? Um, like well, line by line, like. Well, line by line, I just want to, you know, you want it to be smart, you yeah. know, and thoughtful. Um, so it, it's like, it's easy to, to sing songs, a song like, you know, when you're, you know, young and saying smash the state. It's like, yeah, I believe that kid, you yeah. know. Do I believe the 50 year old man that's gonna say smash the state, you know, it's like, I think when you get older, the world, it gets a lot more complex and nuance and like what's going on. And I think as time goes on, your, you know, your, uh, your views change. And um, so I was just writing, you know, I think I, you know, a song like Living in the Twenties, I was writing about how, like, like it was a lot of like things going on at that time where it was, QAnon and uh, the insurrection and, and all this stuff. And so I was just sort of trying to write almost like a coming from a lyrical collage of what was going on. And, uh, you know, like the American dream is killing me, I think is 
no, there's no such thing as like what I would consider the American dream anymore. There's no, you know, because it means so many, it's been broken down and means so many different things to different people. I mean, yeah. you know, ask Native American people like yeah. what the American dream means to them. Yeah. You know, yeah, and then there's like, uh, you know, or uh, it's like, you know, my parents who, you know, or, who c come from very, like, uh, you know, humble working class backgrounds. My father was a truck driver and a teamster, and my mother was a waitress. Yeah, and but they were able to afford a home. Yeah, for their kids. Yeah, and that was in the seventies. Can't do that anymore. Yeah, you know, I love what you mean by that though. Like in the when you when you're in your twenties and you're angry at the world, there's an honesty to that. There's, yeah. a, there's an honesty to, I want to tear down the system, I want to get rid of it. When you get older, in your 50s, it's harder to write those kind of songs because, well, not that it's even harder to write those kind of songs, but like, you're coming to it from a place of like knowing a little bit more about how the world actually works, but that doesn't mean that you still can't get angry about it. Yeah, you, you, you lose your naivete because you don't have the life experience, or you, you get the life experience. And then you understand, and you also have, an like some empathy for people that some of the people that you love in your family that are completely op opposite ends of political spectrum. Yeah. You know, the I, I watched the the videos of you guys in London last week. Was it last week you guys did that surprise kind of pub gig? Yeah, yeah. Where you played a lot of the old songs. Um, I have a bunch of questions about it, and they all kind of have to do with the Im impact I could tell that some of that old music had on people. So as I mentioned, it's the 30th anniversary of Dookie, which is crazy. Um, Mike, I think you saw people who were who were there in their 20s and, and 30s and, and 40s, and I'll, I'll count myself in this, who that record sort of became generational to them. What were your hopes for the record when you made it, and when did you start to figure out that, or did you start to figure out that this record is meaning a lot to a certain generation of people? First off, when, uh, when Duke, when we recorded Duke, we wanted, we just wanted to make a record that would be around for a long time, that it would just last the test of time. We wanted to make a, a record that we could go look back on 20 years from then and go, we're really proud of this record. These are great songs, and it was recorded, hopefully recorded to capture us in a way that would still be listenable a long time from then and not be dated. So that was a conscious effort from us. It was like you knew that you didn't want to make a record that sounded Absolutely. like 1983, yeah. 1983 Oh, wow. We actually yeah. talked about it a lot. I mean, because yeah. we, we knew sonically certain records had, you listen to them, you go, yeah, that was recorded in the 70s. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah, recorded yeah, in the yeah, 60s. Yeah. We just wanted to capture Maximum Green Day at the time, whatever that was in the studio we were in. And you know, we took our time and recorded other things, which with the 30 year anniversary, we dropped some demos yeah. from then and stuff. Yeah. Um, but because we wanted to learn this new way of recording on nicer equipment, if yeah. you will. And then, um, but really didn't understand how much it meant to people, you know, because we didn't really look back for a long time. Um, right. You know, fast forward 10 years later, we do American Idiot. And then we realized this, this is a whole different generation of people, get, or kids and people in general of all ages getting into us. Um, but it starts to show itself when people go, yeah, I bought, you were my first record. Yeah. And you can look at them and go, all right, okay, cool. Well, you were uh, eight because you're 18. Or you can almost guess their age. And then 10 years later, you're going, oh, well, you must have been you know, 18 when you got American Idiot because now you're 28. Or, yeah. And I don't know. I think Saviors could be that next you know, era of Green Day. I really do. I mean, that's kind of what I meant by a statement. Like this feel, this record feels like you guys establishing yourself as a band still that can still make your favorite, your, your, your favorite record. It's funny to look at the articles around, like I read these articles from 94 last night, right when Dookie came out. I read this article in NME, like the British music magazine. And it said something like, uh, it said something like, well, that Dookie is out and people seem to really like it. They're being called the next Nirvana. Um, the, uh, they're being called the next Nirvana. They're packing crowds. They're about to play Woodstock 2 this summer. <laughs> and time will tell whether that will be the thing that kind of makes their career. Trey, I thought that was a really interesting thing to read before that show. <laughs> Did you feel, what, like, what are your memories of the, of the moments of that show? And did it feel like that, that was accurate? Like that was sort of a moment of an inflection point for you guys? I mean, I, like what Mike said too, like we kind of had our ears pinned back and we we're in a new town every day. We kept like just 
playing and playing and playing, and we didn't really reflect back on things. But we did, um, like, we kind of, like, said, oh, when are we going to go back in the studio and ma make Insomniac? Like, we, we yeah. let's make another record. Yeah. You know, let, let's make Donkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, um, but yeah, that, I, I you know, also uh, kind of stayed away from reading um, articles about us because it's, you know, if it's good, it'll get to your head. If it's bad, it'll piss you off. So yeah, 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 you know, yeah, yeah. So it kind of, kind of shut that part of my brain off. And then other parts of my brain started shutting off also <laughs> through the years. Yeah, yeah, that'll happen too. Yeah. Um, Bill, you were laughing when I said that, that this article said that if they play Woodstock 2, it's really going to happen for them. Oh, I just get a smile on my face every time I think about when we played Woodstock. It was just, I don't know. I, I think about it, how it just turned into the big mud fight and... Uh, <laughs> For some reason, like we were, what a lot of bands I think would have thought as a bad situation, we turned into a triumphant situation. You know, it was just so. And I love that we have a whole track called that that is on the 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 live record for Woodstock and it's called Shit Show. Yeah, and it's just like it's just our our basically the sound of instruments falling apart because of mud. You know, so. But uh, no, it was just that, that was, uh, I knew after that, that something, because at the time it was like, that's where it was like pay-per-view. You could, so people could watch it at, at home. Yeah, I remember was, that. Yeah, yeah and yeah, so yeah. like, and so many people watched it. And I remember it was a bit upsetting to my mother a little bit because I pulled my pants down. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, dur during the show. and um, But you had a feeling that, like, um, like we were, it, life was going to change after that show. Really? I think it did. You had this feeling that life was going to change? I, I think so. Yeah. I think if we felt it. Yeah. It was. Uh, well, and we sort of knew right after because we jumped right back on to the, um, the Lollapalooza tour. Right, you guys and were already on. Kids were just yeah. rushing security, and uh, we were opening the tour, and you had thousands of kids rushing security and packing, packing the place. And every day they're sort of yelling at us about it. And we're like, I can't help it, man. It's just it is what it is. But um, you could tell things were different. And you got your teeth knocked out, didn't you? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Ruggedly handsome, anyway. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> that, that, that was my next question. Um, I watched the people sing "Basket Case" back to you at that show in London. I saw each of them individually have this moment where they could like sort of relate to the lyrics themselves, these kind of kids in their 20s and 30s. But that was a long time ago for you, Billy. Can you still relate to that guy who wrote those songs about? Yeah, absolutely. I think a song like Basket Case was like about having like a lot of anxiety and panic attacks and um, sort of feeling like you're you're losing your mind and I mean, that's that sounds like a the the Disney ride from hell that it's an all ages thing, yeah. <laughs> you know. So it's uh, um, yeah. I I mean, I definitely I think it's like like you sing it every night, and I, I think some people might think it might get like uh, just um, like oversaturated or dulled down in your own. Uh, but I mean, it's I like. You know, every time we play it live, I'm, I'm, I think, I think to myself, thank God for this song. Yeah, yeah. Man. I mean, that's, I think that song at, at that time that when that song came out, you know, kids singing along to that song, whether you, whether it's nowadays or then, you gotta think nobody was talking about mental health back then. Yeah. And so that song was re something relatable for a kid that you know might have been feeling the same way. So when American Idiot came around. Was it a conscious effort on your guys' part to, like, I know we were talking about, like, trying to make a record that other people are, you know, still kind of auditioning for being the biggest band in the entire world. Like, when I was reading about American Idiot last night, it was really interesting that you had put out this, like, greatest hits record, and you started to feel maybe a little bit old, and and um, you, you started building in, like, band talking time into, into rehearsal time. Where was the band 20 years ago when you guys were making American Idiot? When like when we really started to think about like making something 
we wanted to make like a monumental record in our career that like w that was really ambitious and that was like this is going to be you know like you, know, you get stars in your eyes and you, you know every band wants to have like their sergeant pepper type of moment yeah or, or whatever and, and and um and i think we were in the studio where we had the access to the studio every every day in oakland and so we just at that point we 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 did start to, like like let's talk about what we want to do let's see what we want to do want to do and the two songs that really came out of that was the song american idiot and homecoming uh which homecoming was like the, in its original version was like it was it felt like this sort of mini opera and so we didn't know exactly where we what we wanted to do but we knew that we were on to something and i remember sending those two songs to rob cavallo and rob was like this is it this is it because he's so ambitious and he gets really like you know that child like wonder about like like we're gonna make something that is like you know an album of the ages and it's like uh you know that it's, it's really <laughs> exciting and you're like like so we just started thinking about conceptually where who this american idiot is and it, all of a sudden it became about these characters like saint jimmy and what's her name and and then it got into the uh, uh, god uh, jesus of suburbia yeah, yeah and it was like and that was really we were like oh my god we're making that kind of record that we've always wanted to make um and um so it was like I don't know, like, 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 just one of those moments where we're like, we get to make this concept record. Did it feel like it worked? Like, did it feel like, wow, we, we kind of started a second life for the band? Yeah, it was. I mean, we were like hanging out like every day, and um, some days we'd come in and like, like Billy and Rob would be in there, like, just like t doing shit, and like, hey, and then we'd go, okay, what's going on in there? I don't know. Like, look, the windows are steaming up, man. This is cool. And then, <laughs> Check this shit out. Like, oh yeah. Well, it, it also started branching over into other things. I remember like there were certain things that like Mike would show up and like be like he would show up in like these different like fashion, like the clothes, the way yeah. that things started to change. And it was like, okay, this is everything started to come and started to incorporate into what we were doing. And it was like then, you know, that's like with the black shirt and the red tie. Yeah. And, yeah. And things like that. It was just like there was a full sort of a swagger that happened when you we created the, like our gang felt like it was firing on all cylinders in the studio. But there's a side of it too that like, you know, we didn't know whether it was going to sink or swim. We just wanted to make this this record that we thought would be our monumental record, right? Yeah. We finished the record, and we had to have a moment where we just sat with each other. Uh, we literally finished the record. We met at the studio again. I remember we went up to this little crow's nest area in the studio, climbed up in this little area and sat down and just said, look, I don't give a shit what anyone in the world thinks about this record. I, uh, we love this record. And let's just bottle that feeling. And we said to ourselves, don't read any press. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care what the world thinks, which by the way, was the stupidest thing we could have done. Because the one time in our life, we probably should have read all yeah, the press. Yeah, you <laughs> get really, really, really good but yeah, yeah, right. it was just bottling that feeling of be proud of what you've done you know, who cares what other people think about it? Because don't let them in this world that we've created, what we were proud of. And you protect know? each other. Yeah, protect your child. Yeah. That album. <laughs> it it kind of, kind of. I mean, it really did work out. I mean, I, I remember as an outsider, like, who was really into Nimrod and really into Dookie, just watching this band that I love, like, take off and start, start playing arenas. I think what I find interesting about this whole thing is that, like, I think, I think the way that you guys get talked about as wrong sometimes. Because I think people talk about you as like, people sometimes frame you as a, as a punk band and they say, oh, what happens when a punk band gets really, really big and starts doing arenas? I don't actually think that's the right way of thinking about your band. I think what's really interesting about you guys is that any band that gets the arena level of like American Idiot would be okay stopping. Like a lot of bands at that point would be like, you know what, we did it, let's go play Greatest Hits for the rest of our lives. We all know bands who've done it. We don't have to say them right now. But you're sitting here right now talking to me about Savior saying, we want this to be the biggest record of our career. Can someone tell me where that comes from? Like, what's, what's going on with this band? We still care about the kinds of songs that we write and, and how much effort that we put into it. And 
uh, make you know, and trying new things at the same time as like coming together and and just writing just like a badass songs. Um, and I think that you know that's uh, you can get older, you yeah. can get old, but just don't stop caring. You know, that's where I I come from when it comes to making music. Um, and th those are my favorite artists, are the ones that still care about what they're putting out. And it's like, and, and not going through the through the motions. Mm -hmm. So for us, that's kind of what Green Day is about. That's a beautiful thing. Rapid Fire, uh, favorite song on Dookie? Oh, geez. Um, Rapid Fire. Favorite song, <laughs> I, I, I meant to give more time for it, but I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, It's like kind of like a one twenty-seven minute song, uh, <laughs> the entire album. <laughs> uh, I, you know, the one with the drum solo burn on it. Burnout. Yeah. Burnout. Yeah. F favorite song in American Idiot. Ooh, oh, it's got to go with uh, Jesus Suburbia. Yeah. I just for for fun, a song to play. Yeah. I would say for me. Favorite song on the new record. Most meaningful song on the new record. Um. I gotta say, father to a son, probably, and not just for for a lot of different reasons. You know, it's like, uh, you know, it's a song that is uh, dedicated to my my sons, uh, which and which was uh, pretty emotional to go there. And I want to also add that my son just married a girl a couple of years ago from Toronto, Canada. Hello, yeah. you're, you're kind of Canadian. Yeah, right yeah I'm kind of Canadian. That's why you're doing the great job. Yeah. That's why I saw her now. <laughs> Boz, I can't, I can't begin to tell you how incredibly nervous we all were to meet you because you're a lot of our favorite bands and your oh. records have made have meant a lot to us. And thanks a lot for making the time, Boz. It's really lovely to meet you. Thanks, awesome. thanks man. Yeah. Great talking to you. Yeah.